to be a modern person? Do you have to be a young, fairly un, uh, you know, unknown at the start of the Obama thing back in 2007-8? Do you have to be a modern person or could Rush Limbo do this as well? If you get my point, uh, you know, social media, are they for a, a new wave of people or can the old regime do it as well? Well, I, I think one of the most interesting things um, that I think would partially answer that, it's a, it's a mindset, right? Do you view your education as over or do you view life as the idea that you're going to be learning as long as you're here? Um, one example is um, the pharmaceutical industry in the United States has had to change some of their marketing because so many more senior citizens are, are going online yep. and cost comparing. Uh, and empowering themselves. Um, so clearly it's not a question of just a purely generational uh, split. It's much more uh, a question of am, am I still willing to learn? Um, and for a lot of folks it's like am I willing to kind of embarrass myself for a little bit and admit what I don't know? Um, but that, uh, that clearly can be surmounted by people. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's limited uh, by age at all. It's much more a, a frame of mind. I mean, what you're touching on there, well, what the whole operation is about is what they call in the business the network effect, the, the multiplication of messages and contacts and so on. And that's really what you're riding there, isn't it? So you, you're borrowing something that's very important in, in the business area as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And this current campaign, we're going into 2012, obviously. Uh, you say it'll be different, but different in scale. Will it be different in any other way? Will, what have they learned? What have you guys learned from the, the, the previous campaign that you're going to build sure. in? The mistakes, if you like, of using social media. Well, and, and that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think the most difficult balance uh, the, the, the president is going to have to strike is how do you remain presidential while still trying to hold on to some of that early hunger and still trying to remember uh, how easily dismissed we were at the beginning because those are two kind of dichotomous uh, actions. Yeah. Um, a lot of presidents took what we kind of casually refer to as the Rose Garden strategy which was basically insulating themselves in the presidency for as long as possible um, and then engaging in the presidential kind of political side of it uh, in the last four or five months. I think one of the effects of social media as well as the amount of um, PAC money, and that, that's private money that's being uh, spent on advertisements in an undisclosed fashion, is we have learned that no attack can go unanswered. That doesn't necessarily mean that the principal themselves has to do the answering, but I grew up in the Kerry organization and some may remember the term swift boat veterans for truth. I learned very, uh, I learned the hard way that you can take a decorated veteran and drag them through the town square um, and smear them with tens of millions of dollars. So I, I, I think we're in a situation where the, the, the president looking forward can't not engage um, on some of the political uh, issues, but needs to at the same time focus on job one, which is being the leader of the country, um, and then modulating that with the realities of the fact that you can't let uh, attacks go unanswered. So that's, yeah. that's probably the principal thing that's different is that, in the very short way to answer is that, he's president now. Okay, quick final point and we go to our panel, which is something you didn't touch on, obviously time limitations there, uh, Roger. That, that, to what degree is this kind of whole machine you talk about, the social media machine, also a policy-making tool? Because it's not just a one-way conversation, is it? It's two-way and you're getting feedback from people about issues, about topics. Does that get built into the machine? Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of fluff. Uh, I gave three examples of... Uh, but a, a very tangible uh, policy reversals, either advertisers leaving Rush Limbaugh, um, social media outcry against a popular women's foundation being um, so 
hot and heavy that they actually turned um, and reversed themselves within five business days. But, and I won't get into legislative minutia, um, despite the fact that I live in Washington, D.C., but there's been some uh, legislative efforts recently in this climate of scrutinizing women's health uh, that have very directly been shot down mainly by social media, mainly by engaged uh, middle-class women across the United States, which is not a demographic that anyone wants to mess with, believe me. Women decide American presidential elections. Um, but there were some legislative initiatives um, that are just too arcane to get into right here, but they were basically going to be constricting women's ability to make decisions about their own health. And those were punished, and their wings were clipped by social media, sometimes in less than 72 hours. So it's very, it can be very, very real. Yeah, very, very important, obviously. Okay, we're going to get a panel up here now and share their insights as well. Some of them indeed have been actively involved in the political domain as well. So first up, please show your appreciation as our panelists join us. First up, Rishi Saha, who uh, is currently a regional director for Hill and Knowlton Strategies across Australia, Middle East, Africa, South and Central Asia, quite a big portfolio, but relevant to today's session. Um, he joined Hill and Noten about eight, year, eight months ago, August I think it was, wasn't it, um, from the UK Prime Minister's office in London, uh, where he was uh, David Cameron's head of digital communication. So obviously a very important insight. Second up is Christophe Ginistri. Uh, good morning to you. Uh, bonjour, as they say in your country, I think. <laughs> he specialised in the internet and technology sector for quite a number of years. I think he calls himself a real digital evangelist. He founded his own PR agency in France. He's now Deputy MD EMEA Edelman. Uh, good morning, Christoph. Nice to see you. Third up is Maha Abu Elanain, uh, over two decades now in corporate communications and PR. She's now head of global communications and public affairs with MENA, which is a region for, for Google, driving the Google communication machine in like 18 countries. And our final member, Jay Walsh. Good morning, Jay. He's a great fan of the social media revolution. Worked on issues management with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and communication with various government departments as well in Canada. He's now head of communications at Wikimedia Foundation. For those of you who are not fully aware, that's the parent company of Wikipedia. So, I'm going to ask all, all of you, I think it's a great lineup, a terrific lineup, from the looking here at this whole new social media phenomenon. And so I'm going to ask each of you, maybe start with you, Rishi, at the other end, um, just a couple of minutes, you know, just give you an overview here about uh, the sort of social media concept, if you like. and. Um, is it something that in 10 years' time we won't even talk about because it's all disappeared? It's just a passing fashion. Anyway, which are your thoughts? Thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here as well. Um, I think most of us are going to be speaking in English, if not all of us. So as someone who's now moved to the Middle East, I will start by saying shukran. Atta Sharif bil hadithi mahakum. And, and I really hope I got that right, because otherwise that would be really embarrassing. Um, so as to whether it's going to be around in 10 years' time, I think the phenomenon that we talk about, social media rather than individual tools or websites or platforms, absolutely will be. I think it's been a really profound change in the way that we communicate, we talk to each other, we learn, we build businesses, and I think that's absolutely going to stay and I think it's going to grow. Um, I, think, I think I've just got three very, very quick observations. One is around... Um, we think of social media as being new, and you know, indeed there are lots and lots of new tools and lots of new technologies, but actually to me, and interestingly, the, um, the, the, the undergraduate degree that I studied, I studied uh, a classics degree, so I spent many years studying ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and actually many of the principles which drive social media are not new, they're absolutely age-old and historical. It's just the simple fact that we all want to keep in touch with our friends and families, we all want to connect, we all want to learn, we all want to keep in touch. And the fact that we now have tools that make that even easier and learn and connect with each other is a really exciting thing. But to me, the, the real thing that's driven social media is absolutely an age-old idea. The, it's a fact about identity and it's something about community as well. And I think just, just one little example on that, I, uh, my, my wife and I are recently very lucky to have our first child. And moving over to this country, um, being able to use social media and social tools and forums and blogs to learn about it, because any of you know, any of you who are out there who've had children know it's amazing and scary. And there's lots of stuff that you don't know. And actually being able to use social media tools, actually instead of formal 
formal websites was an incredibly invaluable thing. <laughs> um, I think the second thing is around what this merge of PR, public relations, and digital really brings up. You know, in terms of being in the formal PR industry, um, as you've heard, it's only been fairly recently. I've spent almost my entire career in British politics. But actually, what PR and digital can do, and the intersection of that is really profound. And you can do lots of things for organizations, I found, that are well beyond the traditional context of media relations and public relations and reputation management. And you can move into areas such as your employer brand and recruitment. You can look at areas of uh, research and development and taking on board new ideas from your customers and your business partners. And so to me, the really, really exciting thing which comes from the merging together of PR, traditional PR, and social media and digital is not just about better media relations, better stakeholder engagement. It's about it opens up whole new territories of activity that you can get involved in, which have huge, huge business performance objectives as well. Um, you know, one little example, and actually building of something that, uh, that, that Roger was saying about the move from the campaign and into government. One of the sites that I, was, uh, that I helped build when I was in government was called Red Tape Challenge. And this wasn't about um, promotions or just news media relations. This was about a social media website that said a lot of businesses in the UK, and I'm sure this is the experience of many businesses in other parts of the world, have a real challenge with red tape and bureaucracy. So we opened up a website where every couple of weeks, different sectors, different industries, could talk directly to government policymakers about the, about the regulations and the regulatory burden that was affecting them. And to me, that's a great way of using social media for something which will enhance the quality of government, enhance the quality of policymaking. And my, my, my final point of three is just about, I think, the, the most profound phenomena of social media, which of, of many, is just about barrier to entries. And, you know, we think about how this has changed so many different business models, whether it's you know, whether it's the hotel industry and hospitality, whether it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's politics as well. And the barriers to entry of getting involved in these industries is so much lower than it ever used to be. And I think that is, to me, the most profound change. And you talk about barriers to entry. You just heard this incredible story about how this one guy, who was basically unheard of five, six years ago, went on to now become the most powerful man in the world. And a lot of that was, was catalyzed by the use of social media and digital communication. So to me, what changing barriers to entry has done in politics and in all the industries that you're involved in, to me, that's a profound change, which I think we're only just beginning to feel the start of that effect. Okay, quick point, Rishi, while you're there, though. Uh, how did Cameron stack up, Prime Minister Cameron? Is he uh, Mr. Digital? You know, we were able to make some great strides in digital communication, some huge things. I mean, for example, <coughs> we went out onto YouTube with uh, his own video blog um, called Web Cameron, which was launched in September 2006, only a few months after. Um, after he became leader of the Conservative Party. And so, first of all, as an individual person, he was absolutely a user and still is a user of online and social media himself, which made it much easier as an institution, as you all know working for companies, if the top person, if the CEO or the chairman is an enthusiast and understands the benefit, it makes your life a lot easier. Um, but I think more than that, I think he was great and really in terms of understanding where communications was going. That one of the things in opposition, and I'm sure Roger can totally empathize with this, is that you know, in opposition, our communications team, the whole thing, advertising, digital, uh, media relations, was probably about 25 people um, in the whole Conservative Party. And we were up against the government, which spent in 2009, 2010, the equivalent of about $2.8 billion on communications. So the asymmetry of resources was, in, was incredible. And we were, as, a, you know, as some would call the challenger brand, being able to use social media, digital technologies, direct communications to reach out to the public and to get our message across when you're fighting against a $2.5 billion a year government communications uh, vehicle was incredible. And he absolutely understood that. And to us, that was a very, very powerful thing. OK, thanks. I move on to you, Christoph. You need to, I mean, this session is about social media and public relations. But talking politics, you know, you've got a, you've got a presidential election uh, in, in the next uh, few months. Uh, can you share with us some, some insight, if you like, as to the role of social media in the political machine now in France, as well as the general? Well, th 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 thank you for, uh, for, uh, for asking me that question. I'm, I'm delighted to be here in Dubai, and uh, I, I want to thank the organizers to, for inviting me. Um, what is interesting to, to realize is that most of the traditional uh, leaders in politics uh, in France or in some of the countries in, in Europe uh, 
just do not know, do not understand how social media, uh, how that can take benefit of, of social media. They still have a view of a very vertical approach on social media, which is a traditional media approach. They, they want to send message, they want to express things, and they want everybody to listen to what they are saying. So they, are do, not, they do not integrate the social dimi dimension, which is the, the most important one. And the reason why they do not integrate it is basically because of two elements. The first, when you think about social media, you have two words, social and media. Those two words are not new. You know, you know social relationship, you know social, how social uh, dimension can work. You know media, traditional media. In fact, people believe that because they know the two elements of this world, social media, they know how to deal with it. But in fact, it's totally different. The fact that you know how to build up social relationship and the fact that you know how to deal with media doesn't, doesn't mean that you know how to deal with social media. And the, the thing is, the most important thing in, uh, in, uh, in France regarding the political campaign and uh, the election campaign, because the president will be elected at the, in uh, just a little bit more than a month from, from, from now, is that uh, politicians still do not accept to be exposed uh, to social media, to citizens, and to people that are just going to engage with them directly. They have this, this kind of old-fashioned behavior to, to, to do speeches, to organize you know, a very vertical uh, communication strategy, and not to engage with people, because they, they don't know people. They don't know how to interact with them, and they're, they're scared about what they can get out of discussing uh, and talking directly to people. And what is interesting is that, uh, at the same time, social is becoming obvious. What is interesting, uh, many years ago, we were talking about niche media, and then we talked about new media. Today, it's not anymore niche, it's not anymore new, it's mainstream media. And what is interesting to realize is that social media has become the mainstream media. It has become the number one media where conversations are going and where conversation people need to engage on those social media because this is the most important place where people will be interacting. As an example, today, uh, when we are in France having a big show on TV regarding the elections, we've got an impressive peak of Twitter users, of Twitter usage, uh, at the same time, at the same, at the same evening, because people want to share together what they are seeing on TV, what they are watching on TV. And if the, the person that they are watching on TV is doing a mistake or is saying something wrong, immediately people will go to social media to check wh where is the truth. There was, a, the, 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 there was a TV show last week in, in France and one candidate uh, was telling about another one. Um, well, if he wants to join me, uh, and not, not compete alone, he'll be free to join me. He was saying, <coughs> this candidate was saying this on TV. If the other candidate wants to, to, to make a, an uh, uh, we, we wants to join me for this campaign, is, is, is uh, more than welcome. And you know what? Immediately, two minutes after, there was a Twitter uh, message from the, the other one saying, no way. And in fact, what it was interesting, and, and then the journalist who was on TV, the, the, the journalist who was on TV said, in interviewing the, the first candidate, said to the first candidate, by the way, you've got an answer from, from what you were saying 10 minutes ago. Uh, Mr. de Villepin, he was to say, I said, no way, I will never join you. Uh, so it was, you know, it was a kind of a, this is, this little example is showing you, is showing all of us that social media has become in France or elsewhere in the world the mainstream media where the conversations are, are, are important. And when, when preparing this, uh, this, uh, this conference, um, there was, a, there was a, a question in the program said, what will be the next step? What will be the, big, uh, the, the, the future of it? 
I believe, I personally believe that the world social will be the common factor of every activity online. It's going to be shopping, it's going to be traveling, it's going to be uh, sharing, it's going to be discussing, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, inventing, it's going to be creating, it's going to be whatever you want. What is interesting is that the social factor will become the main factor when doing something online. And this is something uh, that is very, um, very good to consider because it's, it will bring more value to the conversation and more value to the discussions. Okay, Christophe, thanks for that. And by the way, I forgot to mention when I introduced you that you're also uh, president-elect of IPRA for 2030, so congratulations on that. Thank so you. We'll see a lot more. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Maha. Um, uh, the point that Christoph raised there is that all these different media are going to be totally pervasive, you know, everywhere in every aspect of our lives. And I think the point of our session is, where does that leave public relations as an industry, you know, as a profession? Because increasingly it would seem to us, as outsiders, that it means that, that consumers and the public are directly involved. There's no intermediary anymore. It's fully transparent. Well, thank you. Thank you for this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you for, for having me here today. I'm unique that I'm the only woman on the panel and the only Arabic speaking, so I can take some questions later if you want. Um, actually, it, it creates a lot of opportunities and challenges, I think, for the industry. I think right now, everyone is spending their life online. And I think social media and the implications for public relations is creating a better experience. I think people are sharing more. It's creating better experiences for their brands. It's actually building a communities. And in the beginning, it started maybe with Facebook with uh, communicating between friends. Then politicians became to go online because that's how you reach voters. Then social causes started to go online because that's how you read, reach people in the community. And then businesses started to create brands and create pages so that they can, from a business perspective, go to where their customers are. I think there's several challenges for the communications industry in terms of public relations. The first being speed. The speed in which social media works creates a challenge for people to protect your reputation and to manage your reputation. Um, second is the source. It's no longer the broadcaster or the editor who is the source of the news. It's the user who is the source of the news. And you are the source of the news. And your friend is the source of the news. So controlling the source is going to create a great challenge in communications for communications professionals. The third thing I would say is access. Anybody who has access to the internet is empowered to create change. And it doesn't have to be access on your computer. It can be access on your mobile. All you need is access. You can send a tweet that can destroy your reputation in a matter of seconds. And then um, the last thing I think I was thinking about when I was uh, coming over here today is like audience defined. It's not enough for us to just watch news. We want to participate in it. We want to share in it. So the audience is defining what's newsworthy, what's not. I mean, a funny example I was uh, talking about last week, uh, Angelina Jolie was at the Oscars, and everyone knows she had this famous pose and her leg was sticking out. And it wasn't enough for everyone just to take that picture and move on. Everyone created parodies with the picture of their leg coming out of the Statue of Liberty and stuff like that. So it's how people like to participate in the news and, and define in terms of being the audience on what they think is newsworthy and what they think is, is not. And so I think as communications professionals, you're not just targeting news organizations, you're targeting almost everybody because everybody can create news. Everybody can become what at Google we call tastemakers. People that take news are influencers, accelerate it, push it even further, and help people participate in the news by taking it viral. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, Jay, the final comment at the beginning of this panel session, if you like. I mean, you come, if you like, from the, the wiki world, don't you? Uh, Wikimedia. What does that mean, wiki world? I know what it means technically. I think wiki, as we said yesterday, is the Hawaiian word for quick. But wiki means something else as well, doesn't it? It means everybody doing everything together and all the rest of it. What does it mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it does mean quick. It's Hawaiian for quick. It's named after the airport shuttle in Honolulu that takes you downtown. Um, named by Ward Cunningham, who's the founder of the Wiki. And what Wiki means in a, a technical context is any online platform that uh, kind of starts from zero. You know, it's, it's, uh, somebody was asking me yesterday about the technology behind installing a Wiki. and uh, Can we install a Wiki? And, and it's actually, it's a little technically complex, but it's not much different from starting a WordPress blog or starting any other technical platform. 
Um, but it starts with nothing. So imagine a, a site that you create and there's nothing there and it only exists and it only uh, proliferates when other people come and populate it. Um, Wikipedia started with zero. It started from an empty space that Jimmy Wales proposed as a, initially as a staging ground for, for a, a place where people could take a previous project that was also encyclopedic in nature and they could bring um, what were at that point still sort of editor approved articles and they had about, I don't know, I think they had less than a thousand articles, maybe even less than 500 articles and they needed a way to speed up the process. They were all using in the late 90s uh, email lists and different, you know, uh, different kinds of online fora that are not dissimilar today but a small, much smaller community of largely academics and particularly smart people um, and they said, hey, everybody, we're having some trouble. This project's not moving very quickly. Could, could you help us out? Completely intended only to just feed the project, but it turned out that people had a really uh, incredible time writing the article about the panda, um, writing the article about, you know, uh, bluegrass music or the North Pole. None of these things existed because it was, a, it was a, an empty space. And it, it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't, it wasn't an extraordinary uh, revolution. It took years. I mean, the project's now been around for 11 years. It's in over 280 languages. Um, we have about 100,000 active users. But, and, and this is a, a great story for social media, is that it, it doesn't actually happen overnight. Crises can happen overnight. You know, really frightening things can happen overnight. But successes take some time to build out and build energy. Uh, and that platform of a wiki uh, uh, is now prolific. There are, there are, you know, the software's free, it costs nothing. Not surprising, like a lot of the tools we're talking about in social media, they cost nothing. Um, they, they may cost some money to manage, but you can start from, from, from zero. Um, and you can create this platform where other individuals can come and do work. And everybody asks the question, the classic question in the wiki space, well, how can you trust the, the person who's making that edit? And who's in charge? And do you take stuff down? And I get to spend a lot of my time talking to journalists and people all over the world and say, well, it's, you know, there isn't anybody in charge. Or everybody's in charge. Or nobody's in charge. Depends on your perspective. And it's, it's baffling. And it's very difficult to wrap your mind around that. But that same challenge, actually, that same requirement to, to rethink technology and to rethink communication is what we're talking about here today, which is what if that's possible? What if it's possible for everybody to participate in this? Um, and what if it's risky? Of course it's risky. How do you go through and move forward in these kinds of projects that people, by the way, really, really want to participate in? And you have to have trust and you have to have a high level of confidence that it's not going to go terribly wrong. All social media has the capability to go bad overnight, but it doesn't necessarily. It, it's mostly an incredible, uh, and, and the Obama campaign is a great example of that, that it, it blossoms and it moves very quickly, uh, and people tend to do good things. So um, I'm, I'm proud to be able to represent a project like Wikipedia that is, in fact, uh, a wonderful thing that is largely the product of unpaid volunteers who collaborate online uh, with a shared mission, uh, and they have fun writing these millions and millions of articles because they want you to be able to read them. Um, but Jay, you've given us a sense of the size, right. the sheer size of, of, of Wikipedia and that whole wiki world, if you like, the universe. Uh, and there's a lesson in it, isn't there? Because there's a famous old outfit called Encyclopedia Britannica. And that's been around, what, a couple of hundred years? And basically, you wiped them out. They, they didn't change their model, and you wiped them out in effect. So there's a message here in general, isn't there? You better get on board this whole thing. Um, or, the, or your business and your approach to life is going to be out of date very quickly. Well, let me say, yeah, you're competing with, we don't, we don't think about competition uh, in our work. We're a free knowledge project, we're a nonprofit. People do this work for, for free because they care about what it means. And the fact that we're not a competitive entity makes us a competitive entity to many different organizations. We compete with, with the top five most visited website in the world, but we didn't aim for that. We didn't, we, our, our ad spend has been zero forever. Um, so, you know, Britannica is a really interesting case. They just yesterday announced the suspension of the printed edition. Um, they're still around. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, throw one out to Britannica. They're not gone. They're, they're still, they still have a, an online edition. But certainly the model has proven its success that people really want to. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're here for you now. If you want to stick a hand up, we'll get a microphone to you. The number of hands gone up already. We're going to go there first, and then we're going to be sort of democratic. We're going to go secondly over there, be very wiki about this, I think. <laughs> so, first, and if you could just tell us briefly who you are, and uh, we'll know where you come from. Yeah, here, yeah. Behind. Wait, wait, wait. Well, no, no. He's, he's part of the team. No, you can't come in yet, okay? <laughs> You're on later on. Anyway, got your own session. <laughs> we'll get to you if we can. Sir. Thank you very much. I'm Sule Sule from Nigeria. Mr. Rogers, 
Uh, you spoke about messages that you received on daily basis running up to 150 billion. And 70% of these came from spam. Now, uh, most of the social media uh, outfits are faceless messages. And in most cases, a person, one person can sit down and be sending messages, so many messages. How do you authenticate these messages that you received that really they emanate from different personalities? Because the problem with social media, as I came to understand, is, uh, is that sometimes you hardly know the true position of those messages. How do you handle such cases, please? Okay, is that for you, Roger? I, th I, th I think so, but I think I can answer it just as an individual and a consumer, since um, most spam makes itself relatively obvious in that it is um, a clear um, kind of uh, attempt to deceive someone in the sense of like a lot of the spam that, that, that I get, I can just glance at the subject line and know. Um, it's similar to like when you go through your mail, uh, I can tell uh, from the subject lines who's actually writing to me as if it, the equivalent being like something that comes in the mail that's actually handwritten. And how did I just end up on a list where stuff was blasted out to tens of thousands of addresses indiscriminately? Um, so I think it's the, the judgment of individuals that mostly, uh, mostly is brought to bear um, on that initial kind of vetting of that. Um, but I think anyone in the room knows within a second or two of opening up an email if it's actually from an individual who sat down and wrote it or is it from some program that is spitting out tens of thousands of, of these things. That, that would be my short answer just as an individual. Okay, thanks for that. So, try and get as many questions in as possible. Yeah. Uh, okay, this one and then one behind you also. My name is Tamim. I'm from Saudi Arabia. And I have to do something with volunteerism, which was mentioned by a couple of the members of the panel. Uh, what what uh, attracts volunteers to come to any activities? One. Two, how can you govern volunteers? How can you manage them? There is no reward system. There is no punishment system. How can you make sure that they uh, adhere to the purpose of the activity you are asking them to adhere to? And finally, after you created the momentum of volunteerism and that uh, presidential campaign is over, that activity is done, what do you do with that momentum? Huh. Okay. Rishi, do you want to have a crack at that? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the, the first thing is to remember is that they are volunteers and they're not staff members. And so it's up to you to keep them engaged and to keep them attracted and wanting to work with you. I think, I think political organizations have a bit of an inbuilt advantage because we've always worked as volunteer organizations. I joined, I joined the Conservative Party as a volunteer, not as a staff member. So I kind of know what it was like to be there. So the first thing is to give people very, very specific activities and tasks that they can do, which are achievable and play to the fact that they're not getting paid. They probably have a day job as well. I think the second thing is to give people really, really clear, great forms of recognition as well. You know, we couldn't, and you know, we actually we learned a huge number of things from the Obama campaign as well. We obviously had to anglicise them, make them appropriate for a British audience, but we tried to do all sorts of things that would reward volunteers for doing things. So, for example, we had like weekend competitions where we asked people to make whoever could make the most campaigning phone calls um, in their own local area, they would get dinner with the chairman of the party. So we tried to make little things, which, by the way, is an incentive to some people, not probably a punishment <laughs> for some. Um, but that is absolutely a reward. So it's trying to find things which are going to be powerful and have recognition to people, and they're going to want to have that incentive. I think the final trend is just to remember that a lot of people out there, they want to be helpful. They, they have an idea, they've got opinions, and they want to share those opinions. I shared one example um, from, from the UK government that we started about trying to, what they call, crowdsource opinion on regulations. But there are loads of great examples in the private sector as well. Um, Verizon, the, the, the US telco, now has a lot of their customer service via forums. And 
Verizon customers can go on there and under a very little bit of light moderation can offer customer service tips and techniques to other customers as well. And they're rewarded through points and every month there's a leaderboard and the person who wins it gets a little prize. Now, you might ask, why on earth would you go and give free advice to other customers for a company which you pay money to? And the point is that people like to be recognized. People have a talent or knowledge and very often they want to share that. And if you can tap into that somehow, if you can understand that phenomenon, whichever kind of business you are, and try and get people to share their knowledge and their insight and their wisdom, you've got a very powerful recipe there. Okay. Christoph, you, were, uh, you reacted to that. You <coughs> yes, I just wanted to make a quick, a very quick comment. Ne ne never forget that the whole history of the Internet is based on volunteers. And the Internet would not be what you know today, what we, know to, we all know today, without volunteers. And without the, 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 the decision of individuals to put online some, some stuff, to put online some, some content, to share it, and to share it for free. We were talking about Wikipedia a minute ago. Uh, Wikipedia is a fantastic, stunning uh, example of volunteering throughout the world. And in fact, from what I've seen in the political uh, engagement, it's more easy to, to, to recruit volunteers on the internet than uh, in the, what we call the real life. Uh, for, for one reason, but because on the internet most of the people believe that they are at, at home. It's internet is their home. Internet is the way they are sharing information, they are communicating together, it's their home. And they believe that it's more easy for them to be volunteer on a space like the internet. And that's the reason why you will find a tremendous growth of social networks, because people want to share, and because people just invest an incredible amount of time to volunteer and to help the other ones to do something rewarding on the internet. Okay, thanks for that. Very anxious to get the Hello. microphone. Hello. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Doctor Araf Al Ajil, Len Otil, Len Araf, and no Ahsan Fakrat and Tother Al An Bad had a session of Bashra. Lewal Gada Al Jamil. Walaki, and I had an Ohana Al Farik, Farik Al Amal in the Amal Maha, Rais Obama, Linajah Al Hamlet in Tihabi, Wahada who are Najah. نجاح أوباما نجاح لجهاز العلاقات العامة فتحية للعلاقات العامة اللي إحنا نمثلها كلنا لأن العقل الأمريكي لم يكن ليقبل هذا التغيير في رئاسة الدولة ولكن العلاقات العامة استطاعت أن تقنع الرأي العام النجاح الأكبر لجهاز العلاقات العامة وهذا تحدي لهذه المرحلة الجاية هو إعادة انتخابه وليس انتخاب أوباما فنأمل إن شاء الله أن يستطيع جهاز العلاقات العامة أن يعيد انتخاب الرئيس أوباما أما السيد كريس فأنا أشترك معك في خبرة شخصية أيضا أنا كنت مدير الحملة الانتخابية للسيد راشد الجابري أحد رجال الأعمال هنا في دبي وكنا نعتقد عندنا تجربة انتخابية حلوة في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة على مستوى المجلس الوطني خلال إدارتي للحملة الانتخابية كنت موقن أن الاتصال الشخصي هو أقوى وأكثر تأثيرا خصوصا في المجتمعات التي نمثلها نحن في المنطقة العربية ولكن ذهبنا إلى السوشيال ميديا وركزنا أيضا على الفيسبوك وحققنا أكبر رقم تسجيل لايك أو إعجاب على موقع الفيسبوك للسيد راشد الجابري كان يومها 12 ألف وشوي كنا كنا okay, Roger, it looks like you've got a recruit there. I think if you're looking for anyone for your team this, this uh, November. I apologize. My, okay. my, my headset was... That. We're just, the clock is really up against us. Uh, but, but welcome your comments and congratulations no, on all the just great work the, you're doing. The last comment okay. was... We had uh, 12,000 likes on the website. On the last night of the night of the night, we stopped the announcement for one reason. 
كنا نريد أن نقول للعالم أن العالم اختارت راشد الجابري فصوت لراشد الجابري كان حملة علاقات عامة لكن أوقفناها في ليلة ليش أوقفناها لإثيكس إثيكال بابليك ريليشن إثيكال بابليك ريليشن أوقفنا هذا الإعلان من باب أخلاقيات علاقات عامة Just keep it brief. The clock is always against us. I'm really sorry. Absolutely right. Uh, I want to extend a thank you to everybody. <laughs> yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, I wanted uh, to point out uh, uh, something that caught my attention in what Mr. Fisk said about women's concerns putting their imprint on the campaign. Very important. I wish our people would also recognize that. Women's concerns are important in policy making. Uh, the question I had is for Mr. Weish. It's about the WikiLeaks. How is that related to the wiki industry um, or trend? A lot of people you know, look for them as a source of information. And just for my own self, I would like to know whether it's a, a trusted source of information, or was it blown out of context by people liking um, that type of news, you know, that uh, okay. exposed? This is, this is a jet, I think, isn't it? Uh, sure, and I, I can, I'll, I'll be perfectly clear that WikiLeaks is a completely distinct uh, entity that is not related to Wikipedia. Um, we didn't trademark the word wiki. <laughs> Uh, it's, and I'm very proud of that because there are so many wikis in the world. But uh, what's interesting, I, I, the way I'd like to respond to that is um, that, first of all, unfortunately, WikiLeaks isn't much of a wiki either. It doesn't really represent a place where people can come and collaborate. It, it has become something quite different. It's become uh, an organization, as I said, completely separate from our organization that has collected you know, variety of, who knows what, what information will be next and distributing it in a variety of different ways. Um, but I would like to, to say that, and I have spent a lot of time reacting to that simply because of the similarity in the naming in our projects, but WikiLeaks has been a, an extraordinary uh, kind of event in, in, in government, um, public relations and communications pretty much around the world, I think. I was at a foreign service conference uh, a few months ago, and it was a very significant point of conversation. What I love about what happened to WikiLeaks, and I don't love what happened with WikiLeaks, but it has turned a lot of folks in government into default transparent, sort of default open sharing kinds of, of people, which I think is an incredible effect, uh, an un, perhaps an unintended effect, or maybe a perfect, exactly intended effect. Um, but if, if any good has come of that environment, uh, I, I've been listening to U.S. Uh, state officials, for example, who, who are now much more about sharing information openly. Uh, many governments um, are realizing, maybe we don't need to keep this information secret. Why don't we just default towards sharing it? My organization is completely open at virtually everything that we do. Um, and that's something that, from a PR perspective, it's very strategic. It saves you a lot of energy because that information is probably going to become public at some point, um, <coughs> with the exception of businesses which have a lot of confidential information. But um, let, it, let the information go as much as you can and uh, um, be prepared to deal with it, but, you know, open and share. <coughs> okay. Uh, again, clock ticking, I'm afraid, away against us here. I'm going to come back to your questions and, and comments in a moment. Just to have one little voting exercise. Well, actually, if we can go to... I think I'm using my moderator's uh, right here. If you like, go to question number four uh, on, the, on, on your notes there. Uh, sorry to jump ahead, but what is the most important? Let's get a, a rain check here or a reality check, if you like, on, on what you all think. Of these, uh, and we're not having Google here and there's no wiki either, but uh, maybe you want to come in on this. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, <laughs> yeah, or YouTube LinkedIn. You know, YouTube, what is the most YouTube important social media yeah, yeah, PR. You vote now, please. <laughs> And Maha, you might want to tell us that actually Google is where tomorrow <laughs> is going to be, right? Yeah, definitely. When you yeah. bought Amazon, that is, and formed Google's on, take over the world. <laughs> there you go, Twitter. 
way up there, and perhaps Roger can come in on this as well, but do you think, Maha, that, that, that Google should be there on that list of questions? Well, Google is there. YouTube is owned by Google, so we're so, present yeah. there. Um, there are about 60, hour, uh, 60 hours of, Google, of YouTube videos downloaded every minute. So that's basically uh, an enormous number that we see happening. So yeah, Google is represented on the YouTube figures there. But we've, we've not talked at all about the other aspect of all these social media, which is the power of search. And the power of search means that power is passing to people, isn't it? It's passing to consumers. It's bypassing the messengers. It's bypassing the PR industry, surely. Yeah, I mean, I think for Google, uh, as search, in terms of the social, obviously we have our own platform in Google+, Plus, but for Google it's about people spending more time on the internet and spending more time searching for things on the internet and living on the internet and spending a lot of their time talking to friends, talking to family, making travel plans, uh, sharing. I mean, we live in a syndrome now where there's this FOMO syndrome where you're feeling of missing out, that you need to be online, you need to know what's happening in the news, you need to follow what's happening. A lot of... Um, what's happening and even in terms of like for Twitter for example it's becoming a news source for us where we go for breaking news where when Whitney Houston died Twitter broke the story 27 minutes before it became on the news and we'll never forget this tweet of uh, this gentleman in in Pakistan who was breaking the news of Osama bin Laden's uh, demise with not knowing what was happening and he was the one that was live tweeting what happened not knowing it was one of the biggest news stories of the year so I think um, the more people spend on the internet um, obviously Google's benefiting from that but in terms of search um, we're trying to do things that make the experience for the user more personalized so people can find the information that they want the way that they want to do it and so we focus a lot on the user and and, and the search results are becoming more and more defined uh, people don't go to the internet anymore just for information they want knowledge I mean, how many have gone into Google and typed in the words to a song? I mean, <laughs> that's not an inquiry. You want it to tell you what's the name of the song you want them to know. So I think people are expecting more from the internet and um, it's a challenge for all of us to try to make sure that we do what the users want and the users believe in. Okay, more questions. Keep them short if you can. Um, I'm going to the back of the room because I know some of you young fellas are on panels later on. Um, yeah, sir, on the, on the aisle, yeah. Introduce yourself. Just keep them short if you can. We'd like to get as much in. Very short. My name's Stephen King. I'm working with the Atislack Group. Lord Tim Bell made some comments yesterday about Wikipedia, about something that happened earlier. Uh, would you like a right of reply? <laughs> oh. Um, I, I, uh, Lord Bell mentioned that, um, you know, that public relations professionals aren't welcome on, it didn't, I didn't think it was this, to paraphrase, that aren't, aren't welcome on Wikipedia. Uh, it is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a real topic, and, and what took place, uh, uh, Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, it was a, a fairly high-profile issue for, for the firm and also for Wikipedia, and it's, it's a continuous issue that we face. Um, the people who use Wikipedia, I, I, I think many of you in the room, all of you perhaps, uh, have a certain expectation of a project like Wikipedia, that it's founded, that it's written by people who have a neutral point of view, that it's high quality, that they provide sources for their information. So um, they, are, they are encyclopedia makers at the end of the day. Uh, they're very similar to journalists that have the same kind of ethical perspectives. So they, in essence, Wikipedians um, will scrutinize the co contributions of individuals who, if they think they have a potentially a conflict of interest, so they're paid to be contributing that content, then the natural reaction is to, is to question the origin of that information. Um, I think that there's, uh, with, with, an, with, with a, an, a PR industry that is growing quickly, um, with more people figuring out that they can get involved, I think our project, many projects, um, are, are looking for ways to incorporate everybody's point of view. That's the nature of how Wikipedia works. Um, there are better ways for public relations professionals to contribute, and I just want to make a plug for, uh, you know, make your websites really great. Make them, share lots of information about what your projects entail, what your businesses entail. Uh, make it easy for people to find, and, and people like on Wikipedia will, will eventually gravitate towards sharing that information as well. Um, be open and transparent, you know, don't lock your information away in your own websites. Um, but the, the ability for you to share more information makes your Wikipedia article better down in the, at the end of the day. But ultimately, I think we all want to appreciate that Wikipedia isn't written by people who are paid to do that work. And so that's, that's why there's a sensitivity in that area. And we're trying to figure out ways that people can participate that's more open. Um, but it's, it's a work in progress. I don't have easy answers for it. Okay. Yeah, let's go to the back of the room first. We'll go to that. Young man in the middle row, right at the back, and then come back to you, sir, as well. We're trying to fit as many in as possible. Yeah, in the middle. Oh, God. <laughs> right. 
thank you, Mohammed Serkal from uh, the UK. Question to Roger: uh, You mentioned the social media and the impact on the election. Did you um, have you made a survey on the number of voters that came from the social media? And uh, also the question of the weakness of social media on Obama election. Thank you. Just to understand your question, how many voters came from social media? Is that your is that your question? I think it's more that social media adds a layer to a relationship that allows you to personalize your communication with someone. Um, we, we never crunched any numbers in terms of how many people did we actually get to kind of begin a relationship with us based on social media. But when I show you that picture of that large event in St. Louis, or even the very small events in Iowa and New Hampshire with 20 and 25 people, we made sure that any interaction with the campaign, we got their information and, and then followed up uh, with, with social media and, and just regular phone calls and things like that. So it was, it was much more interaction driven, um, which kind of gets back to one of the points that I made, or at least it was one of my experiences or opinions, which is social media can accentuate a relationship, it can accelerate a relationship, or it can bring a deeper meaning to a relationship, but I've yet to really see a situation where social media creates uh, that relationship in and of itself. I think it's just an, a, 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 a way to bring an additional layer of meaning to human interaction uh, rather than something that's going to create something out of nothing just on its own. Okay, thanks for that. Sir, so, right down here on the front, is there any microphone there? No, well, hang on. Um, I meant this young fella, third row back, yeah. Are, are you not on a panel later? Yeah, you're a resource. Um, <laughs> we'll hear from you later this afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Khalid al from the Executive Affairs Authority. I would just like to know um, if the, the panel could shed some light on a recent legislation that was turned down known as the Stop Online Piracy Act or SOFA. And uh, we know that your communications campaign was very effective because the legislation was turned down. What um, legislation do you anticipate in the future that may arise with this new social media uh, dimension? May I? Yeah. yeah. Jay's, your, uh, Jay's your guy. We, yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the more visible things that happened on January 18th um, January 18th is a day in the history of the internet that I think a lot of people will remember um, when the internet, many of the sites, uh, Google is also a participant in this effort to, uh, to black out content in opposition to what was called the Stop Online Piracy Act, which was a bill um, making its way towards Congress in the United States. Um, it, is a, it is a bill that in essence um, presented, well, there's so many ways to contextualize it, but in, in, in essence it's a, a, a bill that that harms the way that the internet works and, and harms the way that free and open projects might, multinational projects especially, the way that they might go, they may operate. But though going into detail, um, the, uh, the effort um, generated an overwhelming amount of uh, feedback and social media was at the center of this effort. So we, on our pages, we said, you know, Wikipedia is not available, this is why we'd like you to reach out to your congressional representative. Um, and we had just, um, I think, well, we broke Washington a little bit, all the projects working together. Um, more, more Americans, I think, on January 18th figured out who their elected representatives were um, than ever in history. Um, about, uh, and I think about 30 or 40 percent of the, of the political representatives who were supporting SOFA walked over to the opposite side of this bill. So this bill was essentially killed by that effort. And I think it follows some of the examples that Roger gave about uh, uh, Susan Coleman and Rush, Rush Limbaugh. It's amazing how in the past three months, the number of similar initiatives with extraordinary amounts of momentum have emerged um, and the power of those people to put their voice plus their voice plus their voice. It's just the nature of the social technology. Um, and they're not just saying stuff, they're changing things. So that bill was, was eradicated. And in response to the other part of your question, the future, you know, ACTA and different types of legislation, um, we're hoping to teach the world about how the internet works and that the intricate projects like Wikipedia, like Facebook, social, t social technologies rely on certain kinds of internet legislation or no internet legislation, but um, we want to ensure that the, the kinds of legislation that are created don't harm projects like this and don't hurt social media. 
I think, I'm just on behalf of Google, I think we worked really hard on, on this issue in particular because um, a lot of people think when you think the internet, you think Google and it's synonymous. And, and as a company, our, our primary philosophy is openness of the internet, access to information, free access to knowledge, and um, we even have something called the transparency report. So if governments ask us to take down content, we tell the world that this government asked us to take down content. Some governments uh, block URLs for us, for Google, and so we make sure we report that as well to make sure that people have transparency. So in terms of the Privacy Act and the legislation issues, Google is, is probably one of the companies that's fighting the most legal issues to make sure that the openness of the internet prevails and that people have access to do that, what they want to do online. Um, and we can't imagine having the internet be censored, and so we want to make sure that we fight that battle. And Google collaborated with Wikipedia, and Amazon and a bunch of different country companies. Um, we didn't black out, although the company contemplated taking off Google for a whole day, but I think the world would, <laughs> would suffer greatly from that, so we didn't do that, but we put a black mark on our logo that day in, in, in support of this, uh, this bill. Okay, thanks for Fighting that. The, the clock, I'm afraid, has beaten us, but the panel uh, will be here you know, after this session closes, if you want to buttonhole any of them. But just in a single word, each of you, all these social media, are they a threat to public relations professionals in the long run, or are they an opportunity? Just literally in a couple of words. Rishi? Uh, yes, it's a huge opportunity. Christoph? Um, yes, absolutely. This is the golden age of public relations, I would say. Okay. Maha? I think it's, it's empowering us, and it's making us stronger, and it's making us better, and it's giving us a voice. So I think it's a great opportunity. Okay, Roger? Tools. Okay, Jay. <laughs> um, reality. Reality. Okay. 